Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers giving me the opportunity to present my work uh, in this fantastic seminar series. And uh, it is really an honor. And um, thanks, Ned, giving us a really great talk. I learned a lot about the magic number in phase uh, transition <laughs> separation. And uh, it is now a lot of pressure on me. It's very intimidating to speak right after Ned. <laughs> Uh, but I'll try to do my best. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Fang Yuan Ding, and I just started my own lab at UC Irvine. But today, uh, the work I'm talking about is the one that uh, during my postdoc in the Alois lab at Caltech. Okay, now let's start. We all know central dogma, DNA makes RNA, RNA produces protein. But if we look carefully into the genomic data and transcriptome data, we'll see not all DNA information will be processed to RNA. Actually, if we have a DNA or a gene and it's got transcribed, the molecule will get further processed. Some part of it, we call intron, will be excluded, while the other part, axons, will be rejoined together to form the final products. That's what we normally say messenger RNA. And this whole excluding and rejoin process is called splicing. To simplify the cartoon, from now on, I would just simply use a solid black box to represent the axon area, while a single line to show intron. Okay, the big question is, why cell do splicing at all? Why transcribing the DNA and then splice part of it out. Kind of a waste of energy in the physics point of view. So the answer to this question uh, most commonly is it can increase biodiversity. Basically for a single gene, by alternatively choosing which part of the intron axon being included or excluded, we can generate different isoforms. And this is a process we say alternative splicing. And from a single gene, we generate different products and therefore improve the biodiversity. However, if we look deeper into the transcriptome data, we will see a lot of introns always got spliced, no matter for which isoform. And therefore, they're not contributing to biodiversity for sure. And those type of splicing we call constituted splicing. They're actually ubiquitous in uh, uh, eukaryotic cells. More than 95% of genes can turn in those constituted splicing introns. And now the question is, what's the function of those constituted splicing then? As they don't contribute to biodiversity at all. Uh, there are some hypotheses. For instance, uh, this is just the re evolutionary redundancy, or this is um, there's some spliced introns function that we we're not we don't know yet. Um, but today I'm trying to look into this question from a different angle. Well, splicing, as I mentioned here, uh, exclude the introns and generate functional messenger RNA and export it to the cytoplasm. However, this is an enzymatic process, and that means their efficiency can't be 100%. So from time to time, some molecule will remain unspliced. And most of the times, those unspliced transcripts with intron return is, will get degraded directly uh, inside the nucleus without generating any functional products. And therefore, we can consider splicing as a gene expression filter. And we can define splicing efficiency as the ratio of number of spliced isoform versus the total number of transcripts. And the type of gene expression filter will depending on how splicing efficiency change with transcription level, the number of substrates of this enzymatic process. So we can ask whether this efficiency decreases with the lab transcription or increases or actually independent of the number of transcripts in the system. So before I show you any experimental uh, 
results, I'd like to first emphasize a few things. Um, Ding, sorry yeah. to jump in, but could you move closer to the computer? There's a little hiss in the background. Oh, sorry. Let me see. I probably can also increase my voice, uh, microphone. Um, is it better this way? Um, the his volume is also going up, so, so this is good. This is good. Oh, uh, it's the noise. I'm not sure where the noise comes from. It's... Don't worry about it. It's not too bad. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so a few things I want to emphasize first. First one, splicing uh, efficiency quantification requires a single cell measurement. So here as showing the cartoon, for every single cell, uh, each dot is representing one RNA molecule, the isoform. And we use the blue dot to show the spliced one, while the red dots show the unspliced one. So to quantify splicing efficiency, we compare the number of dots, the ratio inside each single cell, and then average the ratio through the population. And this measurement is different compared to if we mixed up all the dots together and do a single ratio at once. And this is because of a simple, very simple mathematical rule that mean of the ratio is not equal to ratio of the mean. So here, population measurement is not just average of the single cell quantification, but actually biased towards the high expression cells. Well, single cell measurement is necessary, but it's not sufficient yet. Previous uh, research have shown splicing mainly happens co-transcriptionally. And also most isoforms, different isoforms have different lifetimes. And therefore, if we, quant uh, if we count all the dots inside the cell and do the ratio, the result is also biased. What we actually need is a way to quantify the number of different isoforms as the transcription active sites inside each individual cells. But how can we achieve that? And that's why we use a technique called single molecule fluorescent institute hybridization, always a fish. And this is a technique originally developed by a few labs, uh, Bob Singer's lab, a uh, Tiagi lab, as well as Arjun Raj's lab. So if this is RNA target we're interested in, we'll design a set of DNA probes, each about 20 base pair, and pre-label single fluorophore on it. And they're designed specifically hybridized to the RNA target. And a typical experimental image looks like this. Uh, this is a single 293 cells. We can see a lot of scattered little dots here. If we zoom in, it looks like this. And each dot, is actually one RNA molecule. The DNA probe is really small, so right next to each other in a nanometer scale. We, can't, we don't have the resolution to distinguish each fluorophore, so all of them gathered together show as a single dot here. And apart from all the scattered dots, we can see a much brighter one here. And this is actually the transcription active size. A lot of RNA molecule is generated, produced at this single site. And if we look more carefully, we can even see some of the RNA molecules is spreading out from the transcription active site. So now we're back to our slicing story. Uh, we inter stably integrated a synthetic mini gene RG6 into a fixed locus of 293 cells. We choose this mini gene because it's a well studied system in the splicing community. It's a gift from Tom Cooper's lab. And then we designed three prop sets, respectively hybridized to one intron area and two axon areas. And the typical image looks like this. And again, we can see two types of dots, a much brighter one, the transcription active size, and a lot of scattered little dots. And uh, 
another spatial uh, information is very interesting. As you can see here, the intron only appears in the nucleus, while the axons can show up in both nucleus and cytoplasm. And this observation is consistent with our previous knowledge that intron never uh, fairly gets out to cytoplasm while the axons can appear um, everywhere inside the cells. So now we'll use the colocalization to identify different isoforms. For instance, if a dot appears in all three channels, that means the transcript contains intron and axons all together, it's an unspliced isoform. But if a dot only appears in the two axon channels, that means the intron is already excluded and this is a sliced isoform. Now we can zoom in to the image here. And again, we see two types of dots. A very much bigger, brighter one is the transcription active sites and a lot of scattered little dots outside the, the single RNA molecule. And uh, for the scattered dots, there are two types. Uh, let's focus on a blue circle one, for instance, this one. And this dot appear in all three channels, the intron and two axon channels. And that means this is unspliced uh, transcript. And uh, this observation also confirmed our previous hypothesis that the splicing efficiency is not 100%. We do observe unspliced isoform inside cell, outside of the active site. And another type is the orange circle one. Um, for instance, let's focus on this dot. It appears in both axon channels, but doesn't exist in intron channel. And that means it's a spliced version. And if we zoom in to the cytoplasm, I didn't show the intron channel because it's totally blank. Uh, for the two axon channels, you can see the dots are pretty good uh, localized with each other as every single one of them is the spliced messenger RNA. Okay, now we can identify different isoforms and back to our original question, we want to quantify splicing efficiency, therefore the number of the ratios but we want to quantify them at the transcription active site. Obviously, we can't just count the number of dots within these big dots because this is spatially not resolvable. So instead of using the location of the dots, here we try to quantify using the information of the intensity of the dot. The idea is pretty straightforward. We will quantify the intensity of all the individual dots, therefore single molecule intensity, and use them as a calibration unit to quantify the number of transcripts within this big dots. It sounds very straightforward, but in reality, there's a lot of technical issues. For instance, we're trying to quantify intensity across different fluorescent channels, which has different fluorescent background. And how can we extract the intensity unbiasedly? Because we're doing ratios, so the bias can actually generate some uh, systematic error there. So to solve this issue, I adapted some methods from astrophysics. It's very interesting to see that our fish experiment look like a lot of galaxy image. And luckily, astrophysicists spend years to quantify the star intensity at different backgrounds. And I just borrow some of their wisdom into our system. I have limited time here, but I can say, I can tell you uh, they work fairly well in the biology system as well. Okay, now with the technique, we can finally quantify splicing efficiency at the transcription active size. We can back to our original question, what type of gene, uh, gene expression filter splicing can provide? Well, to look into that, apart from splicing efficiency, we also need a different level of transcription. So we put our synthetic mini gene under induced promoter where we can change the transcription level. And with that, we found splicing efficiency actually increases with transcription level. And that means for this enzymatic process, the more substrates we have, the higher the efficiency it gets. 
And that's why we say it's slicing an economy of scale matter. But this is counterintuitive. How uh, enzymatic process work in an economy of scale way? To make sure this is not due to some systematic error in our system, we did some control measurements by compare the ratio to axon readout, and this is constant. One might also argue this is a synthetic system. How about the endogenous ones? So we also tested in an endogenous gene GLI-1 in 293 cells, and we induced the gene through the hedgehog signaling pathway. And we found very similar economy of scale pattern. So it seems altogether both endogenous and synthetic genes splice in an economy of scale manner. So again, this is counterintuitive, and how is that possible? We are trained as a biophysicist, so in order to find the reason, we build up a small model. This is a classical mechanism model. Splicing factors, the enzymes bind to pre-mRNA, the substrate, form some RNA protein complex, and then generate spliced isoform. And some of the pre-mRNA remain unspliced. And based on this simple model, what we get is diminished returns, the opposite of economy of scale. But this intuitively makes sense. But this system at high transcription level with more substrate, we titrate out the available enzymes in the system, and therefore the efficiency gets lower. But again, this is opposite of economy scale. So I'm trying to see what's the difference between the reality and this simple model. I dig into the literatures and I found one interesting phenomenon that splicing factors are actually not uniformly distributed. They have some spatial compartmentalization. If we use immunostaining uh, to label the splicing factors, they will show as some speckle format inside the nucleus. So I started to wonder this uh, non-uniform distribution will change the availability of the enzyme for a particular gene and therefore affect the splicing efficiency. So to verify whether spatial organization affects the splicing efficiency, I did the following experiment. For the exact same cell where we do fish experiments where we label introns and axons. We also immunostaining and label out the splicing factors in the nucleus. And therefore, and then we overlap the different channels and identify the position of the transcription active sites as well as its distance to the nearest speckles. And then we quantify how the splicing efficiency at this active site as a distance to the speckles. And what we found is the efficiency decreases to the distance. And this intuitively makes sense. That means you further away from the speckles, your efficiency gets lower. Remember, we have splicing efficiency increase with transcription level, and now we observe the spatial distance also related to splicing efficiency. And therefore, we can expect this spatial organization is related to transcription level as well, and it does. For the same cell, we transiently transfected the synthetic RG6, and then we fished multiple active sites in the cell. And we found they co-localized pretty well with the splicing speckle distribution. And therefore, the spatial organization is also correlated to the transcription, active, uh, transcription level. So now, this uh, spatial non-uniform distribution is related to splicing efficiency, and we want to see if we include this factor into our model, whether we can observe economy of scale. So previously, K on the binding rate, we set it constant because we assume the enzyme accessibility is uniform. 
Now, to show the non-uniform distribution, we simply set KM proportional to pre-mRNA, the substrate number. Just to say this is a proof of principle uh, setup. I'm not claiming it has to be linearly proportional. But with this a simple modification to the model, we actually switch the curve from diminished returns to economy of scale. Notice that I'm only changing the accessibility of distribution of the enzyme in the system. I'm not modifying any of the amount of the enzyme. And therefore, at very high transcription level, the system will still get titrate out and we back, go back to diminished returns. And at this high end, the two curves overlap perfectly with each other. So to show as a cartoon, for high transcription cell uh, active site, there's more available enzyme in the neighborhood, and most of the transcripts will be thoroughly spliced and generate functional messenger RNA. Well, for the weak active sites, there's less available enzyme in the neighborhood, and therefore they will remain, high, uh, they will remain unsliced and get degraded. And that's how it generates the economy of scale behavior. Okay, so splicing acts as economy of scale way. And so what? <laughs> What's the potential function of this economy of scale filter? So we propose the two idea here. First, it provides a potential solution to the longstanding mystery of transcriptional leakage inside cells. So Due to economy of scale of splicing, transcription leakage is very weak transcription, and therefore their products won't be properly spliced and thus not generate any functional products. There's no effect to the cell. And second, it can change the shape of messenger RNA expression distribution. For instance, if this is the original distribution of transcription level, that the number pre-mRNA, based on different shape of economy scales, we can change that to bimodal distribution or long tail distribution. And just to say, all this distribution patterns does exist in biology uh, transcriptome data, especially during stem cell differentiation. Okay, take home message. Today, I showed you splicing can act as a gene expression filter in a surprising economy of scale manner. And this probably due to some spatial non-uniform uh, compartmentalization in the nucleus. It provides a very uh, a surprising new function apart from biodiversity to the ubiquitous splicing regulation layer. And the second take home message I want to emphasize is a single molecule and single cell methods can provide a more direct and quantitative understanding and quite often unprecedented inside of cell biology. And I'll definitely continue this research philosophy in my own lab. And if you're also interested in this topic, uh, I'm actively hiring at the moment. Uh, please send your CV um, to the following email address. Taking a little advertisement here. And last but not least, as I mentioned, uh, this work is done during my postdoc, so I'd definitely like to thank my postdoc advisor, Michael Alois, here. He's been so helpful and so supportive. Um, pretty much the ideal postdoc advisor I can think of. <laughs> have nothing else to say. And of course, all my foundings and collaborators and uh, the whole great team in the Alois lab. And I think I run out of time and uh, happy to take questions now. Thank you, Ding. Um, I see a question from Rav Bunshu, and let me go ahead and read it. Um, if instead of changing the transcription level of your report, if you, instead of changing the transcription level of your reporter construct, added a neighboring construct and changed the transcription level of that, would you expect your reporter slicing efficiency to depend on the transcription level of the neighboring construct? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. This is actually my ongoing project. Because of the spatial, you can uh, expect that the neighbor of the high expression genes will affect the neighborhood of the other genes because you change the distribution of, uh, of the slicing factor. And this is ongoing project, and I don't have a clear answer for that. But this is a very good question. Um, question from Robin at 1155. Could constitutive splicing allow for a background activity that can be rapidly adjusted? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't, I kind of got cut out here. Uh, no worries. Uh, repeating the question, it's at 11.55 if you're looking at the chats. Okay. Would, const would constitutive splicing allow for a background activity that can be rapidly adjusted? Uh, background activity that can be rapidly <laughs> adjusted. You want uh, to let me explain. Um, you mentioned in the beginning that there are two types of splicing, functional uh, variability and constitutive splicing. And the riddle was, is why do you have constitutive splicing? So I was thinking about, for instance, kinase phosphatase activity, that you have constitutive splicing so that if you need to turn on the functional splicing, you can rapidly do it because it's already there. So it would be a question of uh, being able to have very rapid switching ability. Oh, actually, uh, here, the alternative splicing uh, include a lot of uh, different factors. So uh, there is definitely research showing phosphorylation effects, those splicing effects, but there are also um, what we say uh, enhancers and repressors for alternative splicing as well to decide whether certain introns axons got included or excluded. But constitutive splicing is mainly uh, achieved by uh, the whole spliceosome system. And, uh, but for alternative splicing, apart from the spliceosome system, they have a decision of whether keep or not keep particular part, and that includes a lot of factors. Apart from the enhanced and repressors I just mentioned, phosphorylation part, epigenetic regulation, a lot of factors actually included inside. Sorry. Robin, can we continue this uh, in the informal discussions? Um, so there are two questions from Ashok at 11.55. I'm going to read one of them. Um, are splicing factors completely generic across all mRNAs or are they more specific? Yeah, so the splicing factor is actually highly conservative. Um, if we look into their sequences, they actually conserved even from plot or uh, like a pondy, like yeast types to like uh, mammalian cells. They're super conservative and uh, they can target a lot of uh, genes inside cells. So they're not specifically to particular uh, genes. Yeah. So a quick follow up um, on his question is, in either case, how do the factors know what needs to be excised? Yeah, so that's the big question in the field. <laughs> We're still trying to make a, a, a clear picture. To make it simple is, uh, as I just mentioned, there's type of enhancers, there are type of uh, repressors. They're working in a concentration dependent manner. So for alternative splicing, if they recruit for this particular motif, they recruit more uh, enhancers in the field, they tend to uh, actively splice, while if they recruit more repressor in the field, then they tend to uh, escape the splicing process. Yeah. Last question before we break for informal discussion from Gabor. What causes spliceosome accumulation near the transcription sites? Does that depend on the number of exons or does that depend on the number of exons of pre-mRNA, that is mRNA recruiting multiple splicing complexes? Yeah, so that's a very good question. I think the answer is not 100% clear yet. There, there are some uh, studies like Matt is still here, so uh, the phase separation or phase transition, some people think about that. But um, if we do a movie about the splicing uh, speckles we observed here, they're actually very dynamic. Uh, they do merge uh, 
and split uh, pretty frequently. And also, if we do a photo bleaching of certain area, they just reform in a minute's uh, scale, very active. And uh, even more interesting, if we check the cell division period, and also in a minute's level, right before the splicing, uh, right before the cell division, uh, the splicing speckles just uh, dissolve. And when the sap cell is generated, they just coming back directly. And it's like a, all the splicing speckles pumping out at the same time. So it's kind of a, a, a magic still at the moment. And uh, we're looking into the details about how they form and dissolve and split.